Hello and welcome. You're tuned in to the best in paranormal podcasting. This is Darkness Radio. I'm your host, Dave Schrader. And today we've got a great show lined up for you. We're going to jump into that in just a few moments. I want to remind people we have an event coming up, the Holzer Files Hell Frozen Over event. It'll be uh, Shane Pittman and myself from the Holzer Files, along with Bill Chappell and medium Jamie Hoke will be at the Palmer House Hotel in Sauk Center, Minnesota. We are completely sold out now of all of the um, full event tickets, but we do have general admission tickets left for the meet and greet party, all of the talks, the presentations. So if you're still interested in that, $99, you can go sign up for it and come hang out for the weekend and get a chance to meet with Shane and I and Bill Chapel, uh, Jamie Houck. It's going to be a lot of fun. All the information is at darknessevents.com. That's darknessevents.com. And for those of you that have been having trouble with the show the last week here, there has been an issue on Stitcher's main internet website. So if you usually access it through the internet and are having trouble getting it there, make sure that you've got the Stitcher app. It's a free app, and you can actually access the show that way. The app is working just fine. I just wanted to alert everybody to what's going on uh, and make them aware that we are aware of the issues taking place currently with the uh, um, internet version of Stitcher. So they are diligently working on trying to modify and figure out that issue. So uh, as soon as they get that fixed, it'll be running again as normal. All right, today we've got an interesting guest joining us. Dr. Irina McGammon Scott is here. Beyond Pascagoula, the rest of the amazing story. And this is uh, this is a fascinating tale, uh, probably best known for the events that unfolded on October 1973 with the Pascagoula abduction account of Charles Hickson and Calvin Parker. It is one of the more credible reports, but unlike many reports, Intensive research has actually uncovered a number of additional reports of UFO sightings in the area at around the same time. Dr. Scott, thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you for having me. I'm glad to be here. Let's uh, let's dig in. For people that are not familiar with this case, if we could at least do a, um, a recap for them. Uh, what took place in Pascagoula in October of 1973? What took place on the 11th of October, 1973, was a, a reported UFO abduction and of Calvin uh, Parker and Charles Hickson. It's called the Pascagoula abduction, and it's one of the um, best known abductions. And it's probably the best documented of any of them because we've been working quite a while uh, getting other witnesses and things. What happened was the original abduction was is that um, Calvin Parker was uh, 18 or 19 and Charles Hickson was around 45. They um, were uh, shipyard employees after their day of work and they decided to go fishing. And they weren't UFO nuts or anything else like that. They were just regular normal people They'd probably laugh if you said UFOs. They um, went to a couple of places fishing and they weren't catching anything. And so they went to this other place that was kind of marked stay out or something. And Calvin was a little bit nervous about parking there because it was his car and he's afraid they might get in trouble. But Charles said, everything's fine. Let's go. He parks there all the time. And so they went out um, on, they parked and walked to the pier and went out on the pier and started fishing. 
the first thing they saw was a blue light. And Calvin was pretty nervous. He thought it was, a, they both thought it was the police. And he told Charles that he can go to jail because he, it was his idea and stuff. But it was a lot worse than police because it was this object that appeared. <coughs> and um, it was floating off the ground. It was, at first it was blue. And then it opened with this real bright light. And two things that might have been beings or creatures or something grabbed Charles and one grabbed Calvin and took him inside the object and did what appeared to be scans on him and then took him outside. Well, they were both absolutely terrified beyond anything you can imagine. And... Um, they couldn't fight back. Uh, they couldn't move when it was happening. And so anyway, they delivered them back to the pier. And Calvin was just standing there with his hands, with his arms up in the air. And um, Charles tried to break the trance. And I think they both fell down or something. Then the thing disappeared. And um, at first they both said, well, we're not going to report that. And that would be obvious because everybody would make fun of them if you just called somebody and said, well, we were abducted by a UFO. You can imagine how that would feel. So they um, then Charles was an older man, and he'd been in the Army and been in life and death situations fighting in the war in wars. And so he was... Uh, more acclimated to having something like that happen to him. And he said, we should report it. Well, Calvin was never in favor of reporting it. So they, first of all, tried the newspaper, and the newspaper was closed. Then they tried Kessler Air Force Base to report to the Air Force. And the Air Force said that they'd closed Project Blue Book, and they no longer took UFO reports, and they told them to report to somebody local. So they then called the police. And um, you can imagine what the police would think if somebody just called and said, right. um, and I talked to some, I interviewed, you know, some other policemen that weren't there and uh, just heard the report. And they said the report was that the police picked up two drunks that were saying they were reported they had been aboard a UFO and that sort of thing. So it wasn't taken seriously, except that the person that talked to, Hickson could hear um, Calvin in the background crying and pleading not to report it and everything else. So they took it a little bit seriously. They brought him into the police station and um, interviewed him separately and then put him together in a room and somebody talked to him. And the person left and left him alone. But what had happened is that the police had a tape recorder hidden in the room and they thought that with this tape recorder that they would um, find him in the hoax and they thought as soon as the police left that they would be laughing and everything else on the way they had hoaxed him but instead the two men were just absolutely terrified and they were talking in kind of a clipped way you would if you were terrified everybody could tell they were terrified and that uh, made people think they were a lot more take it a lot more seriously. And so it, this was called a mystery tape and it's on the internet. I don't know the address, but um, after that, they were taken seriously by a number of people and they had reported immediately. And there were two of them. Unlike lots of reports where there's just one person and they wait 20 years to say anything. So, um, then the UFO investigators came out immediately and started investigating. So that's one of the reasons it was, and then it just um, blew up. It was um, in all the newspapers all over the world immediately because it was a pretty good report. How were people reacting at that time hearing this report? Was it tongue in cheek and kind of mocking these two guys? Were, were the media 
sources taking them seriously? How would you describe what, what was happening for for both of them? I think it was better than normal on account of the mystery tape and the police. Um, the newspapers didn't really report it as being crazy, but I'm, I think the two men were severely harassed. And I've talked to a number of people from Pascagoula that, you know, they harassed them, said they were drunk and everything, seeing things and all that. So I think the men were very harassed. And you can imagine shipyard workers, what? <laughs> right. Like that. Right. But they were standing by their story. And here you've got a former military guy. You've got somebody with some credibility on this. As we look back on these two gentlemen, had there been issues? Uh, you know, could we look at this and say, and I, again, I'm, I'm just taking the skeptical approach at the beginning here to kind of answer some questions I know the audience will have, but is there any chance that these guys were scoundrels and had done dumb things in the past? And, and you know, maybe they should have been looked at a little bit more skeptically at the time. Well, I think they look, they, a lot of people were very skeptical and harassing him. But on the other hand, some of the top UFO investigators were out there immediately and other people talked to him. And like I talked to the doctor that interviewed him right after it happened, and he said, yeah, they were both in shock and there wasn't any doubt about that. So I think the people that came in contact with him, and especially the mystery tape, did believe him, although it was unbelievable. They see these strange things during this experience. Can you describe to us, and I know that there have been drawings and a uh, considerable amount put out there regarding this. What what type of things did they see? What did they experience? Well, um, they weren't the typical aliens that are in the press. They were quite a bit different. They were... Um, kind of the typical alien is alien is kind of a skinny thing with a big head and legs and big eyes. Well, these things were a lot different. They were kind of heavy set or porky even. They were very, very wrinkled. They, um, they couldn't even see their eyes. Um, I think they were gray. The skin was kind of gray. And in a lot of drawings, um, Hickson reported that where you have projections on your head, like the nose and the ears, but there were things like carrots sticking out. Um, and they both thought the things might've been mechanical instead of beings, that they just gave them the impression of behaving in mechanical ways. Now, the, the beings, did they ever interact with them? Did they you know, speak? Did they give any kind of indication that there was an intelligence there? Aside from being able to traverse the galaxy in a UFO, I mean, I, I mean, like a communicative way. Well, is they both would have, I mean, anybody in that position would try to fight back. And they said that um, they thought they'd been injected with something or had a shot because when the things grabbed them, they couldn't fight back. And they thought um, maybe they had received a shot, but they were like, they were paralyzed and couldn't move except they could see and they were conscious. Um, and for, for, so, uh, for their memory of right then, which was a conscious memory, I think they c communicated by telepathy and told them not to worry and things like that which you would obviously worry. Right. Yeah. That's not, not enough to, to make me more comfortable with the situation. Yeah. How long do they think that they were actually abducted? I had the impression it was about 15 to 30 minutes. They didn't have watches on them, so they weren't. Right. Sure. And they have this encounter, they're returned. Do they show any long-term effect? from being around these beings? Well, uh, Calvin was really nervous about it. And he was afraid they might be contaminated or something. And um, uh, yeah, they had some effects. There were pictures taken of marks on them that might have been puncture marks. They thought they were 
um, may be injected. Um, but we've had people look at the pictures that we had and that came from somebody else. And the ones that on Charles look like just surface scratches or um, just scratches. And the ones on uh, uh, Calvin look like they could have been puncture marks, except it was on his feet. But, you know, it might have been. They might have taken his shoes off, too. Um, and so there wasn't real proof. On one of the documents, sometime later, they said that their eyes were dilated. And um, that wouldn't be from being on board the craft because it was lit up really bright and bright lights would make your eyes constrict. If your eyes were dilated, that might be a sign that you were given drugs. And they thought they were given drugs. Right. Were they, were they tested for that uh, to see, you know, through toxicology, if there truly was something foreign in their system? No. And that's a shame because I don't think there's any blood samples or anything. Calvin was really, really nervous that he might have been contaminated and he took his clothes off and I think he washed in bleach or something afterwards and threw his clothes away. Um, and he was trying to get them to test for radioactivity and things. And they took him to first of all hospital and then to a better hospital at the um, Air Force Base, Kessler Air Force Base and didn't find any radioactivity, but he was very concerned that he might be contaminated in some way and, you know, come in contact with other people. Right. Now, what could you tell us regarding the craft itself? Is this something that uh, fits other versions? Because obviously the aliens sound completely different than what, you know, we're, we're used to hearing. Uh, what was the craft itself like? I think uh, it was one of them described it as being about 30 feet long and maybe 18 feet tall. And I think that was a guess. On the inside, they really didn't see anything. It was just really brightly, brightly lit. Uh, they didn't see furniture or anything. They said that they were, they went through something like that they'd been examined and that something came out from the wall and circled them. And that's sort of like a CAT scan now, except for CAT scan now, they put you on a gurney and shove you in a, you know, a big machine. Well, this seemed like it would, you know, if it had been a real scan, that it was a lot more advanced than what we even have today. Um, and uh, Kelvin ex described the table he'd been, put on is glass and I think that was because he didn't see anything and I don't think they saw any furniture I think they just saw bright lights in these beings or whatever they were did the uh craft itself did it make any sound what all could they tell of it and and did it just kind of appear and do they remember after being replaced did it disappear in front of them there was a sound that one of them described like a zipping sound and it flew away. And I don't know if they, there was some kind of a sound, I think when it appeared too. Um, it wasn't like an airplane or anything though. It was, I think they described it as like a zipping sound. What is the area like? I mean, in that part of the world are are people were they open to this did people start a panic and fear that there was something strange and, and otherworldly around them or was it just kind of oh that's interesting that's fascinating and you know or those guys are nuts and and they just rolled on about their their normal days i think that probably most people rolled on but there were a huge amount of sightings and and from the police we had um like 50 sightings reported for that night of the abduction from other people. And then there were other ones that uh, they knew about that weren't reported. So a lot of people had seen things. And in that case, you might not remember anything from, you know, the October 11th, 1973, but the abduction account hit the newspapers the next day. 
And if you had seen something and then you read that account, you would be able to know when it was. And if it was very impressive, you'd remember that for a long time. Well, people didn't come out of the woodwork, <laughs> uh, report things at first because the two abductees were getting harassed and made fun of. But since then, people, it, the idea of UFOs is now more respectable and people are coming out and saying, yeah, they saw things then too. And they didn't want to talk about it and get harassed then, but they can stand up to it now. So we're <laughs> collecting reports from way back. Speaking of reports, I, I saw through the Mississippi Press Register, um, there was an article that scientists term that the Pascagoula UFO report is true. Was that true? Did, were these true scientists that had come forward to, to make this claim? And what made them believe that there was something more to this than just two good old boys that might have had a few too many drinks that night? Uh, two really top scientists came out to investigate. One was Dr. Alan Hynek. He had been the Blue Book debunker for a long time, but he changed his mind on debunking and was open to UFOs. He was respectable scientist. He was an astronomer with a PhD. Um, I knew him from back here. He was uh, uh, he worked for the astronomy department at OSU, and then he went to Northwestern University and became the head of the astronomy department. And he uh, did um, research and published um, the scientific papers on astronomy. So he was respectable in his field. Another one was Dr. Harder from um, Berkeley, the University of um, California or Southern California, I forget which. And um, he was a respectable scientist too. And they both got out there real soon after it happened and interviewed him. And both of them trusted the two men. They didn't think they were nuts or anything. They took him as honest, and reporting what they saw. And with that, in that area, you know, I, I'm sure people are wondering, this was kind of a restricted area that they were in. Do we know why it was restricted? Was it part of government uh, property? Was there any thing like that that might lend itself to us understanding a little bit better? Uh, where they, it was the area of Huntington Ingalls um, industry. And this was the Navy's largest shipbuilding industry. It was in uh, there in another, another place, but this was a um, important uh, company, very important for shipbuilding. Also, uh, there was a nuclear uh, site there. I don't know exactly what they were doing, probably something with shipbuilding, but the government was trying to hide that from people and they didn't want people to know about. And also Kessler Air Force Base, which was a real big training ground and high tech area. So it was, it wasn't just like, you know, some place by a, the Gulf. It was a, had a lot of military places. Well, all right. So could it be that they misunderstood that this was more a uniform to protect somebody from nuclear waste, nuclear fallout, something like that? And could it be that whoever was inside these uniforms might have taken them to test them to make sure that they were not infected by this, by crossing the boundaries and into that area? It's unknown. It could be. There could be a million theories and it's really unknown they they thought when it was happening that maybe it was the government but there wasn't any evidence that it was a government and this was way beyond what the government can do well at least what we thought they could do right now now we're learning more and more what the government's been capable of for a long time and i'm not meaning to sound skeptical as though to challenge all of your your insights and claims on this again just trying to be the voice of the audience as they're listening along with us on this journey and you know because this is such a unique at least to many of us uh abduction scenario the look 
the feel, everything about it is kind of different than, you know, the big gray aliens, the mantis, the Nordics, the, the things that people have come to somehow accept those aspects of yeah, alien think, uh, forms. But, but the, this is something new, something different. I think if they were lying, that they would look up what an alien looked like and describe it like other people did. And theirs was completely different. And that suggests maybe they're truthful. But everybody that talked to them thought they were truthful just by their own feelings. All right. Now, now that they've had this experience, did either one of them ever feel as though they were visited again by these beings? Or was it a one-and-done situation for them? Well, I think it, with that, you should um, distinguish between what their actual conscious memory was because they were hypnotized. And um, after the hypnosis, Calvin remembered a possible earlier abduction and a later one. But, but that was under hypnosis. Um, some people question hypnosis. I'm not saying whether hypnosis is right or wrong. I just thought I should say that um, what they remembered consciously and what was under hypnosis. Now, they said, Hickson and Parker, that these robot creatures were friendly. Uh, is it just because they took them and replaced them? What, you know, I mean, they obviously they abducted them. They were both kind of unnerved by them, especially Calvin Parker, and, you know, a little bit more frightened by what took place. Why did they have the sense that the creatures were, were friendly? I guess because they survived. Okay. <laughs> so, like that would scare you to death. And maybe they were so happy they were alive that they thought, oh, these are friendly. Now it said, just kind of glancing at this, at this article from back in the day, October 19th, 1973, it says, um, according to Hickson and Parker, we were fishing last Thursday night behind old, what is it? Shopster shipyard building on the Pascagoula river. I turned to get some more bait. When I heard a zipping sound, I turned around and saw a spacecraft with bright flashing blue looking lights, just hovering without touching the ground. It seemed to open up, but there really wasn't a door there at all. These three creatures came floating out towards us. I was scared that I couldn't believe it was actually happening. The creatures were pale ghost-like about five feet high. They were sort of light flesh colored or more like a pale gray with crab like claws for hands and rounded feet. The creatures were on us before we knew it. Two of them seemed to lift me off the ground and I became motionless and glided into the craft. Parker said he passed out as he was carried into the craft. After I got inside, I had no feelings. I was helpless, but I could still move my eyes. It was real bright inside, but no particular color. There were no light fixtures, but it was plenty bright. Something big and round that looked like a big eye moved back and forth across my body. The two creatures moved me around so that the eye could check me in various positions. I just kind of floated without touching anything. I didn't see any attachment for the eye. It was just kind of suspended in the air. The two things left me for a while, maybe a half a minute, and I was in there just motionless. All I could do was move my eyes. I never felt any pain. They didn't hurt us at all. Later, they carried me back outside, and I floated down on my feet. I was so weak-kneed, I think I fell over. The creatures didn't walk at all. Their legs stayed together, and they kind of floated. After I have uh, thought more about it, I believe that they were more like robots. They acted like they had a specific job to do, and they did it. They didn't try to communicate with us. I heard one of them making a buzzing sound. It might have been in contact with something somewhere else. I didn't see the opening in the front of the face move. I didn't see anything that looked like eyes. There was something pointing out like a nose and then an opening under its eyes, or under this, but no eyes. The craft, which was uh, rounded or oval, was about eight to 10 feet wide and about eight feet high, came up as a split second and it left with a zip. It was gone in a half second. They were on us so quick, we couldn't do anything. I doubt if we could have resisted them if we had tried to. I'm sure they are far more advanced than we are. I know now that they didn't intend to hurt us physically, but I feared that they were going to take us away. I would like to emphasize that they didn't mean us any harm. I honestly believe other people will go through similar experiences. I think these creatures will continue to probe this earth. We haven't seen the last of it. 
I've always said that there's uh, almost had to be some life elsewhere. Now I'm a firm believer. Our lives will never be the same, but I felt we owed it to the people to tell what we saw. I don't believe I could live with it myself. I believe we have done what is right. The question I keep asking myself is, why a country boy like me? And that's that's a fascinating take on all of this, and that he was assured or, or, or was positive of the fact that this was going to continue, more people would be taken. It, it's almost like he was given a knowing. Would you say that's a fair assessment? Since they didn't really communicate with him, he, he seemed very clear-headed and understanding that this was not out of the ordinary and would continue. That was his feelings about it. Um and um, I guess that maybe he had some feeling of communication was why he had those feelings. I mean, if it happened to me, I would be so glad I was alive. But, you know, and I was wonder. I would also wonder if other people were thinking of not uh, return. But you know, um, that was his feelings. I guess. Well, what can he tell us about the fact that, okay, aside from two men who claim to have had this experience, was there any other type of physical or um, relatable data? Uh, and I, I mean that because there's another article again that says, men taken aboard UFO nearby radar jammed. That's the headlines from October 15th, 1973. What, what do we know? about these claims of radar being jammed. Are we assuming that because radar didn't pick them up or was there a legitimate hiccup and issue with radar locally in that area that night? Well, I don't think that the radar was the same night. Um, but, uh, this radar man reported having his radar jammed for some time. And he had been, I think he'd been in the military and, you know, knew what radar jamming was. And um, he had picked up something, and then it jammed his radar for a while. We've got, uh, in the article, it says, a Marion County civil defense official reported an unidentified flying object knocked out his radar Sunday night shortly after two scientists said that they were still convinced two men were taken aboard a UFO along the Gulf Coast near Pascagoula. Dr. James Harder of the University of California and Alan Hynek Chairman of the Astronomy Department at Northwestern University said they were convinced Charles Hickson and Calvin Parker encountered a non-terrestrial craft. A short time later, James uh, Thornhill of Columbia said he picked up an object on his radar set. I observed what I thought to be an aircraft, Thornhill told officials. It got rather close to the station, about three miles, then it became stationary, and all of a sudden, my radar just completely jammed. I've never seen anything quite like this, except perhaps during World War II. Thornhill said the radar unit developed streaks when the UFO returned later. Area residents, he said, reported seeing a craft with bright blue lights Sunday night. Thornhill's report was the latest in the series of UFO sightings that reached its most bizarre period Thursday night. Hickson and Parker went to authorities saying that they were taken aboard a UFO. These are not imbalanced people. J. Allen Hynek said, they're not crackpots. There was definitely something here that was not terrestrial of this earth. Hickson and Parker said that they were fishing when a bluish craft hovered above them and they were taken inside by, now it said here, red-skinned occupants without force. And this is interesting because that totally flies in the face of, of the gray or very pale skin story before. Um, the pair said the craft's occupants had wrinkled skin, pointed ears, uh, eye slits, sharp noses, and holes below their noses. Now, again, an article written within a few days of the first one is saying that there were eye slits when the other article said there were not. So there does seem to be some inconsistencies in how the story was told. Is that reporter error? And I'm going to say this wholeheartedly. I've been re uh, interviewed numerous times in the last 15 years, and we'll go back and read the article and think, I never said that. And I certainly didn't report that and, and I've called them out on it and they, well, we just tried to punch up the article. That's, it seems normal in some cases, which is really kind of disconcerting to me, but what do you think was taking place here? Well, with the radar jamming, they had been, the abduction was on Thursday and the radar I think was on Sunday. So it wasn't the same day and it wasn't exactly the same place, but it was still an experienced person in that area thought 
said the radar was jammed. Right, but um, I'm talking about the inconsistencies in the colorization. The you know there were no eyes, there were eye slits. They were pale gray, almost like an elephant. This is saying that they were reddish. Does that start to send up any flags for you when the accounts that were given at the time are being? Um, I don't want to say misrepresented, but that they're certainly they're they're not consistent. Well, I think. Um, with newspapers, you can get different things when reporters <laughs> write things up that they can change things. I think that um, I talked to the doctor that examined him first. He said the very first reports were good. And um, to pay attention to those first ones, but I think, you know, as, it, as more people read it and report it and so on, that there will be differences. I think the two people reported pretty much the same thing for that night, always. I don't think they changed their, you know, what they said. All right, let's do this. We need to take a break. The book is called Beyond Pascagoula, The Rest of the Amazing Story. We have a link up for that book on today's program guide, so you can find it very easy and get a copy for yourself. We'll be back. We've got more to talk with Dr. Irina Scott right here on Darkness Radio. All right. Uh, I'm curious what your thoughts are as we look at this um, story, Dr. Scott. And obviously we've seen a lot, you know, with this case, we've, we've seen that, you know, not only two men had this experience, but an experienced civil defense official reported seeing an unidentified flying object two nights later that knocked out his radar. Uh, you know, two prominent scientists came to the site and actually, um, checked it out and and found it to be very credible but there was a lot more to the story and many more people that uh came forward how do we differentiate though their stories of being real or fictional because we know in the roswell story many people came out after the fact but their stories were discounted because wrong time wrong place wrong information they weren't even in the city or state at that time. So it was easy to kind of de-evolve those stories. But almost 50 years later, how do you separate the, the fact from fiction from the people that do decide to come forward? I uh, interviewed a lot of the people and uh, re tape recorded the interviews with their permission and um, tried in any way I could whenever I interviewed anybody. I asked if they had told other people at the time and who they had told, so that I have some record of that, but in a lot of cases people are dead and you can't find the other witnesses. But I attempted to do all I could to find out um, what they had said at the time and whether they had told anybody at the time. And that's about as much as I could do, But so I do have the information 
and it's something to keep on investigating. Is it one of those where you're just going to report the stories and allow people to make the decision on their own kind of feel? Is is that the the concept of, of following up with a book like this and having all these new stories and new insights to these cases? Yeah. Um, uh, many people would allow us to use their actual name, which means other people can contact them. And um, it, yeah, it just, we're not saying that everybody's absolutely saying the truth. They're just doing the best they can. And so are we is to, um, we didn't censor too much information and we tried to check out what we could, but um, there were, there's a lot we couldn't check out, but maybe somebody else can. So we tried to give as much information as we could. Well, let's, let's look at some of these other cases, these other aspects of the story. What, what stood out to you the most from people that decided to come forward? Well, the person, the people that came that um, I heard about first, were the Blair family, and uh, Philip found out about that. Um, uh, Calvin had given a presentation at the Pascagoula Library. They had put that on YouTube, and somebody wrote in and made the comment and said, well, she knows it's true because her parents were there and saw what happened. So Philip contacted the woman and gave me the uh, phone number and everything of her parents. So I contacted them. And what the, I t first of all talked to the, uh, to her father who talked very briefly and said, here a big splash and something about thinking it was a blimp. And then he turned the phone over to his wife. His wife, um, said that he was a skeptic and that he didn't believe and, you know, he was down on everything, didn't want to talk about it and all that. She said that she and her husband were there that night and they were 